Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Muhi Khwaja with the Muslim Philanthropy Podcast at American Muslim Community Foundation. Today we have on Roweda Abdelaziz, and she is the national reporter at HuffPost. She's been nominated as an outstanding young professional. Uh, so congratulations, Roweda, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so how long have you been a journalist? Uh, I have been a journalist for about, I think, six or seven years now. Um, and I have specifically been working at HuffPost for the past, I think, a little over five years. That's really amazing. And, you know, it's such a well-recognized platform. Um, so uh, what was your journey to becoming a national reporter there? I always had an interest um, in journalism ever since I was a kid. I volunteered for my high school newspaper. Uh, I remember when um, I was in high school outside of the high school paper that I worked on getting involved and in, I think it was kind of like an internship at the time but it was unpaid just getting involved with our local paper and I remember being really excited going into the newsroom sitting around this big table and just being able to discuss and brainstorm ideas. And I'll never forget the first feeling of running to our newspaper box uh, outside of our home and pulling out the first newspaper and ripping through all of the pages until I got to the way back because that's where they placed the bylines of the interns. <laughs> uh, it had its own designated section. They called it the teen scene section um, and catching my first byline. That's awesome. um, and I think my byline was too long. Uh, the whole little way Abdelaziz, it has to be broken up into three lines instead of just the one. <laughs> um, but I was still so stoked anyway, and it was such an incredible feeling. And that was definitely um, when I, I knew that this was something that I wanted to pursue. And so um, I studied journalism and Middle Eastern studies when you know I attended university um, and immediately started working in the field uh, once, since I graduated. That's awesome. And where did you go to school at? Uh, I went to Rutgers University um, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, where I graduated from there. And then I had a number of internships while I was in my undergrad. Um, I was in D.C. a lot, um, in New York City. Um, I did some comms for, you know, the Department of Education. Um, and my first job out of college was working for the Committee to Protect Journalists. It was an internship that uh, converted into a position where I documented press freedom violations around the world. Um, and I took a particular focus in their Middle East department because uh, I am fluent in Arabic. And so that was something that helped me greatly when I graduated. Mm -hmm. And um, my first uh, beat, I would say when I first uh, started entering journalism was really covering foreign affairs, international news, uh, a lot predominantly coming from uh, the MENA area. Again, because you know the being bilingual really helped me in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then in 2016, that's when um, I pivoted to focusing on domestic affairs and more national politics. Yeah, and you know through your work, um, you've been able to help two Yemeni men. Um, who were being held by ICE um, and shedding light on their circumstances, advocating for their rights. So tell us about, you know, the power of journalism. And like, I think that's like a prime example of um, what journalism can do to really help people. Absolutely. When I was working on my story, Chasing Safety, I remember I had worked on a series of stories highlighting the plight, you know, of, of Muslim Americans. I had been covering the Muslim travel ban extensively for the last few years. And through that, I've gotten to know a lot of people and a lot of families who were impacted by this policy. And something that's really important to me as a reporter and as a journalist is really focusing on the human impact that these are families, these are spouses, these are parents, these are our neighbors and friends who are having drastic life-changing decisions on their lives because of piece of legislation. And something like the travel ban who that has been put in place for so many years, I think oftentimes people forget how policies can, can impact uh, these people. And so I really got into work a lot the Yemeni community, but other members of other communities are predominantly impacted by the ban. Um, when I was reached out by someone and I said, um, and they told me, 
hey, I know these two uh, Yemeni men who are currently being held by ICE, but you will not believe the journey that they took to get there. And I was truly in shock when when I found out the entire journey that these men were wanted dead in in their home country of Yemen. Uh, And they had fled to Ecuador, one of the very few countries that doesn't require visas uh, to enter. And being someone from a country like Yemen, right, the Yemeni passport has very little power as to where you can go. Mm -hmm. Uh, Coming to the U.S. was not an option because of the travel ban. And then I learned about their journey that they took from Ecuador, crossing about six to seven countries, going up South America, um, because they were desperate for safety and stability and wanting a better life. And I think people forget that when they think why people take such drastic journeys. Um, And so over the course of several months, I I talked to them almost daily from um, ICE detention. Uh, You know, I was able to speak to to them in Arabic. Um, They didn't speak uh, English that well and talked about uh, their journey and and captivated that for for my investigation that that I published a couple months ago. And um, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, at the end of of that investigation that we had published it, we had shared it widely, and of course, working with a national platform, it was able to get a lot of eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we heard that these two people, you know, who at first they were uh, denied um, asylum, they were told that they didn't have a credible fear. Um, And this is a crucial step in the immigration process for them to be allowed into the U.S. And they were facing a possible deportation back home, right back to the country where not only were they facing war, um, but they had, you know, death threats actively out against them. Um, And then um, after the publication of our investigation, we heard that those decisions were reversed. Um, and that they were granted new interviews um, and new chances to to prove that they were indeed facing threat and that they were indeed posed no harm to the U.S. and that they were just seeking safety. Um, and a couple of weeks after that, one of the two men were was released in the U.S. where he could just be an everyday citizen as he goes on with his case. And our second, um, Osama, he was granted full asylum um, and is completely done w- with his case. And both Osama and Ahmed, the, the two Yemeni men, are now living in New York where they work and they found a community and they're just, you know, trying to go about their, their daily lives. So it's been really incredible to, to watch their story unfold over the last year. Likewise. And, you know, I would have to imagine that those conversations Um, throughout that entire time was just providing them hope, right? And you were giving them an outlet to have their voice heard. Um, And it's really, I think that's the power of journalism as well as just sharing people's voices. And like you said, finding the human uh, story there. So um, really phenomenal work that that you've been able to do there. Thank you. And absolutely, I think, you know, these are people who are trapped in a super complex system in a country that they don't know much about. They don't have much family or friends or support networks here. And so I think just having the opportunity to to share some of their narratives was was incredibly humbling and important. And as a reporter, you never know, right? And and oftentimes you're dealt you're stuck in this um, limbo of this dance of really hoping that this lands on the right desk to the right email that it can cause impact and change because sometimes it does and, and sometimes it doesn't and I think it was uh, alhamdulillah alhamdulillah 100 times over you know really incredible to to see and you know I think to witness that their story was was one that did have you know life-changing impact alhamdulillah and you know we talk a lot about representation in the media and I think you're you know, your identity being unapologetically Muslim and um, somebody who leads by their faith. I think you were able to find that relativeness and and share that authentic voice. Um, So tell us a little bit more about, you know, what your faith and identity mean to you in your profession and kind of how you represent the Muslim community as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think being a reporter that covers Islamophobia and and social justice issues, it is uh, not the most enlightening of, of topics. It's definitely a complex one for many reasons. And, you know, for the longest time, I think Muslims around the country and around the world know that 
they, you know, the media wasn't the most friendly to them. And it wasn't a matter of uh, Muslims asking for something that was unique. I think they just wanted equity because for the longest time we've seen research after research prove to us that Muslims, the Muslim representation in media was largely one dimensional. It was stagnant. Mm-hmm. It was based off of stereotypes. And, and we still see that. And so it was incredibly important to me, I think, as you know, a member of the Muslim community, that I wanted to see that change, not just for my community at large, but for myself and my family and my friends. And so there's definitely that personal tie, which I think um, can be beautiful. And that's really where my faith comes in and, and giving me the strength and giving me the the motivation to continue to do this work, even when it becomes really daunting and really difficult. You know, I remember times where I was covering, uh, say, a hate crime that had happened uh, to someone and then, you know, walking out of my newsroom and, and hopping onto the subway and, and being faced with something very similar, right? And so I think the lines between my professional and personal life can, can sometimes get blurred. But I think that's where I really lean into my faith and, and remembering that concepts like and knowledge is something that is right. emphasized to us. Concept like justice is a big uh, concept in Islam. And these are the same concepts that, that I strive for in, in my professional network and in my job and in my career. Journalism is based on um, you know, knowledge and learning and research. And it's something that goes hand in hand to, to what Islam teaches us. So I think I'm really right. about blessed to, to be in a field where I'm able to able to identify and um, and work with those intersections. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. And um, in terms of, you know, w- what are some projects, you know, obviously election season, but beyond that, like, what are things looking like in 2021 for you? I think in 2021, one thing that I'm going to look at in addition, you know, I think with politics, no matter what the outcome, uh, you know, what the outcome is, uh, Islamophobia is not a problem that's going to go away, right? Our community is going to continue to face um, social injustices, whether it's on an institutional level, whether it's on a grassroots level. So continuing to holding uh, people accountable uh, is incredibly important to me, continue to shedding light on how certain policies and legislations face um, our everyday communities in whatever shape or way or form that looks like. And I think that's something that's uh, not going to go away. I think, you know, I'd like to say that the day I'm able to say I, you know, am put out of a job is actually going to be a a good day because that means uh, we've solved the problem of the intersectionality of racism, Islamophobia and xenophobia. But I think it's something that I'm actively going to um, tackle and and talk about and, and look for equity um, for Muslims in, in mainstream media and being able to di- have and ensure more diverse coverage of the most diverse, the most diverse faith group in, in the world. And so these are all things that I'm looking forward to reporting on in 2021. Well, you know, I think we need dozens, if not hundreds more of Ruedas running around to see their byline in that newspaper. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I'm really excited for you and congratulations on this nomination. Thank you so much. Again, I'm so humbled to accept the nomination and so humbled to to be in this field and really excited for our program next week. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, You know, we'll be hosting you and everyone else at the uh, annual symposium and event is taking place on Saturday, November 14th. So be sure to find more information on our website. And again, just really looking forward to seeing everything that you're going to do. Thank you so much. Yep. Take care.